Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and I got a visitor since I filmed the last video. Uh, wasn't too successful with Sally, but uh, Shaki suddenly appeared and he jumped up and snuggled and stuff. So, you know, he knows uh, he's a video star, right? That killed the radio star. Okay, so in this video, I'm continuing on the new uh, report, which is heavy on the graphics and illustrations, which are excellent, showing all of the immense changes that are happening in the Arctic. The report, you can Google it. It's called Global Linkages, a graphic look at the changing Arctic. And it just came out recently. It's a UN environment report. Okay, so this is the uh, splash page here on the left of the video. And I'm talking, in the last video, I started talking about all of the different illustrations and figures. That was uh, Shaki just jumping off, knocking the camera. Okay, so I think I'm good again. Okay, so the thawing permafrost. Okay, so there's basically three types of um, descriptions, categories for permafrost. There's continuous permafrost. So between 90 and 100 percent of the region is permafrost or frozen ground. Okay, so that's the blue areas. That's the most northern regions here all around the Arctic. Then there's when you have only 50 to 90 percent of the area permafrost and the rest is unfrozen, it's called discontinuous permafrost. And that's the lighter blues color color here. So lighter lighter blues on the fringe of the darker blue coming around here, you know, these regions. And then you have sporadic permafrost, that's between 10 and 50% permafrost. And that's these regions out here. Okay, and then further down, you have something called isolate. You can get isolated patches between 1% and 10% of the area is uh, permafrost. There's also subsea permafrost, known areas of subsea permafrost. This is the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf, which is a big concern, you know, for methane release, for, uh, you know, episodic, catastrophic methane release. And then there's regions of thermokarst, which is, um, you know, it's often where you get permafrost that thaws and collapses and it creates these pools of water, many small lakes and things called thermokarst lakes. Okay, so it's a, it's a, and uh, this is the, the projected permafrost extent, at the end of the century, according to RCP scenarios, RCP 8.5 is business as usual, the permafrost line will extend quite far north, it'll only be in the far north that we have permafrost. Okay, all these regions here will lose their permafrost, and there'll be lots of emissions of methane and CO2. Um, with RCP 4.5, the mid-level, the mid, the the uh, not so severe scenario, there'll still be permafrost uh, within the red outline. Okay, so let's move on from thawing permafrost. Let's find the image, the map. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now we're let's talk about short-lived climate pollutants. Okay, and those are things like methane, lasts for about nine years in the atmosphere, black carbon, okay, from uh, fossil fuel burning, incomplete combustion, fires, biomass burning, things like that. And also the methane in the troposphere breaks down and it, you often, you can get a lot of ozone, the atmospheric chemistry in the presence of the sunlight, you can get ozone created this is not ozone up in the ozone layers in the stratosphere. This is ozone in the troposphere. It's a strong greenhouse gas, okay? And it doesn't, it's reactive. It doesn't last very long. So this is showing the hot spots that generate black carbon emissions. So the colors here, so what there's, there's a couple main areas. This is North America and this is the um, tar sands in Canada, okay? Um, in this region, we've got Europe, Okay, so these are black carbon emissions, kilograms of black carbon per square kilometer per year, the average from 2005 to 2015. So you can see the production of black carbon from European industry, from Chinese industry here, Southeast Asian industry. And the green areas are the black carbon that's produced from biomass burning. 
So the increments here are the same as here. So what you can see is you can see that there's areas, you know, in the in the more not not at high such high latitudes where there's a lot of burning. Um, of course, these are deserts here in this these regions here. So you don't have biomass to burn, but then these regions here, there's lots of biomass burning, you know, to clear clear forests for plantations, for palm oil, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see huge areas here in Southeast Asia, South America, there's some, um, Europe and, uh, you know, Canada here. Okay. This is the Arctic again up here. This is the sea ice extent in September 2018, and then this line outline is in uh, 1981. Um, and uh, you can see the arrows on in the, these are some of the main transport mechanisms for black carbon to get into the Arctic from lower latitudes. When it gets into the Arctic, it coats onto Greenland, coats onto the sea ice, makes it darker, lowers the albedo, increases the light absorption, you know, and is a feedback to accelerate the melting of sea ice and snow cover in the Arctic. Um, these dashed lines are, this is methane concentration in the atmosphere in parts per billion, averaged from 2005 to 2010. So the red dashed line is where the methane is 1800 to 1825 parts per billion, you know, within these red dash regions. So there's high production in those regions. And the dashed lines, the yellowish dashed lines on the outside of the red lines are 1790 to 1800 ppb um, of methane. I hope I said ppb before. And then ozone concentrations, 40 to 65 ppb, um, are in the gray areas here. These are where the ozone levels, um, the ozone concentrations are higher. I think, I'm not, I guess up in here. Not in the desert. I don't see why it would be in the desert. Okay, um, now this plot here, this shows short-lived climate pollutants, you know, and it's just, you know, now we're over the Arctic. And uh, what you can see is, um, this is showing black carbon emissions from residences, okay? The low levels are the darker and or sorry, higher, um, 0 0.01 to 0 0.05, that's tons per year, residential emissions in the light gray, and in the darker gray, it's 0 0.05 to five. Okay, so residential emission, black carbon emissions, flaring emissions, okay, this is mostly from the fossil fuel industry. When you bring up oil, um, if there's methane dissolved in the oil, the pressure is released when you bring the stuff to the surface from deep below where it's high pressure the methane and and other emissions can bubble out the methane you know bubbles out of the of the gas and and there's no pipelines there to put it in in a remote area so they just burn it off they either release it to the atmosphere directly to increase the methane level or they flare it off flaring it off is a bit better slightly better because it converts the methane to mostly co2 so these are areas here western siberia and the ussr um and, the, and uh, Western Siberia and what was the old USSR. Um, and over here in the North Sea, and this is the oil sands, the tar sands in, in Canada, where the, most of the flaring is done. And these are shipping emissions here. So there's all this ship traffic and these are shipping emissions um, in 2015. It's, you get NOxs, CO2, SO2, particulate matter smaller than 2.5 micron, Average measured concentration per, per cells, it says, of 100 square kilometer in tons. Okay, so more than one is, is it, so that you can see where the shipping routes are. Okay, right here south of Greenland, you can see where the shipping routes are. Okay, because those are where the shipping emissions are highest, and then they taper off, you know, as you go away from the main shipping lanes, but there's still significant amounts surrounding the Arctic Basin. This is the methane the mean evolution of methane in seven monitoring stations in the Arctic. These are the monitoring stations. Okay, these dots here are the monitoring stations. And the levels here, you can see 2007 at, at tapering off and then a large rise up to, this goes up to 1900 parts per billion. Okay, um, so let's move on. 
Okay, ocean acidification. And let's see what we have here. Okay, ocean acidification. Okay, it's all about the CO2. So these are trends. This graph shows trends in temperature. Okay, CO2 and pH. Okay, so the blue line, this is the temperature. This is 1990 to 20 to present day. This is the land area temperature rise going up as much as 1.4 degrees Celsius. This is the sea area global rise of temperature going up to about 0.75 or something. So the land warming is almost twice that of the temperature over the sea ocean, over the ocean. Um, this, is CO, this is the atmospheric CO2 concentration in parts per million, 350. You know, we're push, we push past 410. This is the partial pressure of CO2 um, in, and the variability um, in the ocean. Okay, that's the CO2 that's uh, dissolved in the ocean rising. That lowers the pH of the ocean. So this is the pH of the ocean. We drop down to about 8.05 from about 8.11 in this time frame, which represents a, an acidification of the ocean of about 30% or so. Now, what about specifically in the Arctic? Okay, so, so this is showing the, uh, first of all, we've got the river inputs of fresh water around the basin. Um, one rectangle is 100 cubic kilometers per year of water coming in from the river. So most of it's coming from these Russian rivers. And then this is the Mackenzie and the Yukon Okay, and there's some smaller rivers here, smaller here. So that's river discharge. Now it's easier to make um, fresh water acidic. That's a lot easier to do than to make salt water acidic. So since there's so much fresh water, it's to do with buffering and chemistry of the, of the um, ocean water versus that of fresh water. Okay, so the more fresh water from the melt and from the river discharge into the Arctic, the worse the ocean acidification problem can be. Um, now, ar aragonite is a form of calcium carbonate, which is easily taken up by marine creatures into their, into their skeletons and shells, like in, in, uh, um, coccolithophores and foraminifers and things like that. Okay. Now, if there is an undersaturation, then the organism must spend more energy in order to make its shell. And often they can't succeed in doing that. So here's the estimate from 1986 to 2005 of regions where there's undersaturation of aragonite, that's the dark brown regions here. So here, here, some over here. Um, and then the projection for 2066 to 2085 basically is the entire Arctic Ocean, um, the areas around Greenland, uh, up here in the Bering Sea, Okay, the whole region is going to is going to be difficult. It's going to be undersaturated in aragonite, which is necessary for creatures to make their shells. So this is very bad news. This is the Eurasian River discharge. This is the North American River discharge from 1975 to 2015. You can see the trends. Um, this is 2007 when we had that, I believe. Yeah, when we had that um, record sea ice minimum for that time period. Okay, so the ocean is getting a lot more acidic. Okay, now we're gonna talk about some other types of pollutants in the Arctic. So persistent organic pollutants or POPs. Okay, uh, these are things like fertilizers, herbicides and pesticides and things like that. So as a proxy of the sources, you can look at area, the global cultivation intensity. So the land cultivated, if it's 75 to 100% of the land is cultivated, that's these areas here. Then 50 to 75% are these brown, dark brown shades, 20 to 50% the lighter shades, and 0 to 20% the rest. So what you can see is you can see the areas that are most heavily cultivated, and those areas are areas where we apply herbicides and pesticides and create these persistent organic pollutants. And this is showing basically just how the pathways for how these pollutants are getting into the Arctic, both in the atmosphere and um, in the oceans. Thanks for listening. I'll continue.